Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Change Ready, which is an original series brought to you by Behind the Human and Melosi. I'm your host, Mark Champagne. And in this series, the goal is to do everything possible to future-proof your mind and thrive in an era of unprecedented change. Today, we're speaking with Scott and Carissa, co-authors of Assembling Tomorrow, a guide to designing a thriving future. Scott, creative director, Carissa, academic director at Stanford University's D School. And they've got some really interesting backgrounds as well, which I can't wait to dive into. And this book has been inspiring to say the least and and firing off a lot of really good reflective questions in my own mind. So it's a real honor to have you both on the show. Welcome. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for having us. Let's do this. Let's so before because we there's so much we can dive into on the topic itself, but I always let this like to set some context, strip away the titles, all of that kind of stuff, and just ask you both, who are you, lovely humans? Like who are the people in front of me right now? Well, I'm Carissa Carter, and I am the academic director at the Stanford D School. I am a designer. I am an educator and I have a history as a geoscientist as well. Love it. Scott? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Scott Dorley. In addition to being at the Stanford D School, I'm also a designer. I like to think of myself as a writer since there's a book coming out here. I'm a parent. Um, and I, I have this weird job at Stanford where I oversee a freshman dorm. I, I hire oh, the RAs cool. and that kind of thing. So uh, that has been post-COVID quite an experience that has wow. been defining. No <laughs> to kidding. To say the least. And how, like, you, you know, and I, I got this from the book, but just your backgrounds, you know, don't scream to me, uh, designer and all of this, like, Scott, you made movies Carissa, you just mentioned you're a geoscientist. Like, how how does all of that come to be? Like, how did you get here? I mean, I think that it sounds so drastic when you say it like, you were a geoscientist, you made movies, and now you're a designer. Uh, but the reality is it it felt a lot, it felt more gradual. I mean, for me personally, like, I would, I've always been interested in, in in art, in how things get made, and how information is presented. And so my transition from science to design didn't feel like, you know, walking into a, a freezer when I'd been in a sauna my whole life. Sure. <laughs> it was just like another way of approaching problems. Yeah. Um, and the reality, I think, is that we're all multiple things. Totally. Right? We're all so many, many things. And it's fun to tap into different sides of ourselves at different times. Well, design is is everywhere. Like, you know, you can be formally, I guess, a designer or trained as a designer. But I mean, I would almost argue that we're all designers in some capacity because especially when you, you go through your book, I mean, the questions in there, I mean, everything that we're experiencing, at least at this point, started as some sort of thought, right? And in even our current experiencing, we're all kind of co-creating this experience together and 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 designing this conversation in a way. So... Uh, I get that. Yeah. And Scott, I mean, I see, I definitely see that. I mean, I see the link when it comes to, I, I think at least movies and storytelling and, and all of that. But I mean, please do share uh, your thoughts. Yeah. Your point that design is everywhere and that we're all designers, I think is an apt one. And that is what we think about when we think about design. It's bringing an idea into the world with a certain kind of intention and that intention is about what should be in the world, not just what can be in the world. So you mentioned designing a conversation. Yeah, that's a total design opportunity. What are you trying to get out of the conversation? How are you going to set up the feeling of it? Like, for instance, uh, listeners may not hear this, but before the call, we had some time to banter, right? That's a yeah. design choice. And yeah. what we're talking about is how do you approach your life with those kind of choices in mind? What's desirable? What do you want as an outcome? Yeah. Which is so, and this is why I'm so excited for this conversation, because it, I think what your last point there is, it's so important given, I think, where we're at right now and the, just the state of the world. And I mean, I work with a lot of teams when it comes to their mental fitness. I can, I've got a bit of a pulse as well. Like people are, are the minds are full, heavy. There's no shortage of stress and whatnot. Uh, in the outside world, which then of course our inside world is, is also, um, experiencing. And 
I just don't see this getting better in the sense that there's just more and more change and innovation, which is which are all great things, but not if we're if we're if we don't have either the right like a good perspective and definitely some tools to be able to to enter and, and thrive in this world, which I pulled a quote. I, I can't remember where. It's probably somewhere early on in the book, but I think it just it really sets the tone for I think the conversation we're about to have. So I'd love to read it. We are living in the history of the future right now. At times it may feel like things are on the verge of flying apart, but every one of us can assemble a flourishing future from today's parts and pieces. The next 70 years are ours to shape. I mean, that just feels so that just lightens the mood right away and feels approachable. Can you just any one of you just provide any additional context or 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 detail around that that line? Yeah, we we like to we like to say that we're in a runaway design moment and that's really that feeling of overwhelm that you're talking about Mark, right? Yeah. Where our climate is out of whack, there's a, a new algorithm released every day and they keep changing beyond us. We can hack DNA now. Like it is an intense time to be a human in the world. And, yeah. you know, Scott and I are in the field of making things and teaching people how to make things in this crazy world. And we feel like overwhelmed ourselves. Yeah. Me, me too. Also, and I have all the tools. Yeah. <laughs> right? Well, that's exactly it, right? Like even those yes. of us that that really feel like we have all the tools feel feel the feel the pressure and in in you know can get really nervous, but we also know we do have a lot of agency. And yeah. it's about tapping into that that agency and our and our collective power. Yeah. So how do we design this? Maybe I'll flip this to you, Scott. How do we design a mind for the future? Like what questions do, should we start with to just set the tone? Yeah, I think there are a few things. And as you said, they're kind of hard to remember sometimes. So mm -hmm. when you write a book, you kind of start to get convictions around the things that you're writing about. It's an interesting process. You start not trying to figure it out. And by the end, you're like, oh, this is the answer, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, of course, you get humbled later and all that stuff. But one of the things that we've noticed is letting go of this idea of perfection. I've become what I would describe in this process as an anti-utopiast, right? Yeah. Uh, you, the idea of utopia is we're going to get it right. And we're going to get it right. And after we get it right, everything's going to be great. Yeah. And there's just no evidence that that's ever happened. You know, yeah, really, fair. like there's so many utopias tried, so many utopias that didn't work. And so can you just let go of this need to have it all figured out? You know, because when you when you want to have it all figured out and it's changing very quickly, you're not going to have it all figured out because even if you let's say you do it perfectly, you figure everything out, then something changes and now you have a new thing to figure out. So the first yeah. step I think is just to let go of the goal of perfection. Mm -hmm. And get into a goal of being able to respond, being able to approach the things that are changing and, you know, not only change them, but also change yourself to meet them. And that's hard. Well, I was going to say, I, I love what you're saying, but in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking of the listeners and, and even myself, like, how do we do that? Like, is there any, um, I mean, I think first for sure having a conversation like this and just setting that intention is a good first step. But have any of you found any good practices for the mind or the body, spirit, whatever, whatever the hell you want to call it, like to help just let go and I guess it open up the mind to, to possibility. I, I have a favorite activity that we do in the classroom, but I also sometimes do it myself too. Um, it's called a derive. And you, okay. Yeah. And you should say that with a French accent. So a derive. <laughs> okay. I like it. Um, it, it. Essentially, it comes from this uh, person named Guy Debord, who was a psychogeographer in the in the 60s the, when the psychogeography movement was a big thing. And what these psychogeographers would do is they leave their house and they would take a walk, but they would allow the walk to take them. Ooh, so what I you like do that. on a derive is you have no agenda other than to like one way to, you know, mentally get your way through it is say like, I'm going to follow the color blue 
So you Mm. might see something blue across the street and you walk to it. And then once you're there, you just look up a little bit and something else blue is going to catch your eye because you're now attuned to it. And you walk to that and then you do it again and you just keep going. And it's good to just just keep a timer. So say I'm going to do this for 60 minutes with no other distractions and see what you've noticed at the end see where you got to is a way of 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 being in a place that you may be in all the time and seeing it in an entirely different way it it never fails like when we send students out it never fails like they come back and they're yeah every everybody's mind is always reset in a way that they 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 were very skeptical going into it i love it and it (laughs) Anytime you add a little French twist to it, it just sounds more powerful, right? Because you could you could call it a every very time. a mindful walk, but that doesn't right. sound as cool as how you just. I think you're on to something. I think I'm going to give yeah. more things I do French names. Yeah, I'm going like to do it. the same. Yeah, <laughs> or Scott, do you have any psycho geography? Yeah, I was right. going to say a couple things just to build on that. So to allow the walk to take you, right? That requires yeah. a bunch of things, and yeah. the first thing it requires is trust. And there's a woman who is an art teacher in L.A. during the 60s and her contemporaries, she would have Alfred Hitchcock come to her class. Right. So you've got a nun teaching art at an all women's school, bringing in Alfred Hitchcock to talk to the class. Right. And she has these 10 rules of creativity. And rule number one is find a place you trust and try trusting it for a while. Mm. And so, like, we can't just give blanket trust to the world, especially right now. The world feels very untrustworthy to me, Yeah, right? Yeah. In a way, it doesn't deserve our trust. Like, there's too much cynicism out there. But if you can find a place that you trust, you're like, well, this, this place feels good. And then just stay in there a little bit. It'll open up a lot of room to deal with all the other stuff that's coming at, at you. But the idea yeah. of trying trying to trust it for a while, I think, is a cool one. I like that. And I think you you guys talk about this in the book as well, but just, you know, going into nature. And I mean, th- that's a beautiful, I think, example to, to be like, it, it's literally perfection happening all around if you're present and, and taking a look at how all of this is kind of unfolding, right? So I, I feel like that's almost a way to, I'll use, I guess, the, the language of like practice stacking in a way, like you take this mm-hmm. walk in nature, which you already know you're going to get benefits from. There's a lot of crazy things that are happening that we don't even understand, but following the signs, like breathing that nice air. I mean, it's a beautiful way to, I think, reset the mind, right? I, I would love to ask you a little bit more about the students because whenever I, I've done, you know, various talks and whatnot with universities and so forth. And I feel a lot of pressure uh, in the minds of students and in a way that you know, I just don't remember having that level of stress and and pressure being in in university and so forth. So one, I'm assuming you're feeling some of that as well. And when you bring up these kind of practices, how do you position them to, and I ask this kind of twofold because I feel the same thing sometimes when I'm I'm speaking to, you know, uh, 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 leaders that are running multi-million or billion dollar companies of like, "Ah, I don't need this kind of stuff, right? Like, what is this all about? And I wonder if you get any of that kind of from pushback from the students and how you, you know, open them up to a walk like this or other practices. I think a hard thing about being a design student in particular is that when you are trying to come up with something that's new to the world and there's no matter what the design challenge is, you're often trying to notice something that other people haven't noticed before and build in response to it. Um, and. So, but you can't ever do that if you're only filling your brain with the same things you see all the time, right? Yeah. You need to be able to shape shift yourself to approach the world in different ways to do a handstand and see how that feels because you're totally upside down. The blood flows differently. And so it's about trying on a lot of different tactics to see what works for you because not everything's going to unlock an idea, but something will. And yeah. it's a numbers game at certain points, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you can't, there's no magic process. It, a lot of it is a lot of work. Yeah. 
And yeah, you have to be open, right? Like it's just, mm -hmm. I mean, I keep saying the words mental fitness and, and the reason is because physical fitness, we all understand around just like, okay, well, if I don't like to jump on a road bike, then that doesn't rule out all of exercise. Like there's a million different things we can do. Same thing with the mind and same thing with what you're talking about, right? Just to be open though and, and try and through that journey, yeah, you know, you'll probably come up with some, some, some really interesting stuff that could change a lot of things, not just for your, ourselves, but for the world. And I think that metaphor of exercise is right on. We did a project uh, almost 10 years ago now looking at the future of education. Mm. And one of the things that came up was how amazing it is that we think we'll educate ourselves in college for four years and then we're done. And now we go out into the world and we do all our things rather yeah. than thinking of it as the metaphor of exercise, right? So you have to keep learning. You have to keep working your brain. And I think that both with mental, just mental acuity and learning. Exercise is the right metaphor. Like you can't let it just sit. You have to keep pushing it. And to yeah. Chris's point, it's one thing to have the inputs. It's another thing to be able to be open to the inputs. That's actually the hardest part is just being in a place where you don't have a total agenda and you're open to the possibility that's around you. Because those those novel connections are where the new idea comes from, but they don't pay off right away. So you can't sort of have a transactional attitude. You have to go in knowing that this might be a waste of time, yeah. but it's probably going to lead to something interesting, especially if I'm following my curiosity and I'm staying open. Are there any other uh, tactics or way of conversation that you have found helpful and I'll, i just want i'll stick on stick with the students right now just because again i'm getting these questions often around because there's a lot of um i think i don't know it's kpmg one of the big consulting firms did a huge study on uh i want to say 15 or twenty five thousand. uh we'll just say the younger generation and what what a lot of what was coming out of there with were levels of anxiety for they're calling it eco anxiety First time I had heard that mm -hmm. that terminology, which then to me, my mind goes like, wow, there's already so much stress in just every other aspect of life. Now you layer on a legitimate fear of uh, the health of the planet and do we, do we want to bring kids into this, this planet? So my, my question is, what kind of conversations are, are you guys having with students around just keeping them motivated for the future? And, and, or maybe you don't, maybe, you know, D school students are, are at another level and they're not, you know, having, not dealing with some of these, these, these fears, but I, I've got to ask you that. Yeah. So I had these two students create a map of the United States that overlaid levels of eco anxiety. So this worry about shifting climate with, with where people should be worried about shifting climate because it is rapidly affecting those areas for whatever reason. And the contrast between the level of actual worry and the worry that that some places should have created a lot of really interesting conversation because we as humans you know, may tend to worry about the right things or the wrong things at different different times and how much we bring in the context of the world around us, how much we worry about other people. Like these are all factors that we're pulling into our everyday um, ability to cope. And so yeah. I think when we, we have these conversations in the classroom, it's about first centering as to like, what's this coming from? Is it something that's real or perceived. Maybe they're worried about others. Maybe it's about this place or elsewhere. Yeah. Well, I feel, so what, what I'm hearing then is really for any topic, like we just need to talk about it and, and probably talk, talk about the, these fears and whatnot from a place of fact versus narrative or story that we're, or, you know, the, the story and the loops that we may individually and collectively be playing about like, what are the facts and just be have an open dialogue about the situation. So much of this has to do with our imagination, yeah. Yeah, how we're thinking about the future, how we're imagining what's possible. And we think it's important to both talk about the things that might be possible that don't seem possible. You might call that optimism. 
And it's important to talk about the fears and the things that you're totally worried about and you think you're going to go haywire. And we have an activity in the book called um, Drawing Your Monsters or Naming Your Monsters. And it's based on these old maps where they had monsters out in the sea. Actually, Carissa can, can give you like the history of those maps. But it's a way to say there's some something unknown here. And I've seen a signal that there might be a problem. So I'm going to warn everybody and I'm going to do it in this sort of magical, fanciful way. And the not to do it as like, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid. Let's not do anything about it. Because yeah, we can very quickly confuse those sort of imaginary feelings as facts. Yeah. And then we start to base decisions on those. And then that actually shapes the future, right? Yeah. How did you, just even in going through the process of writing the book, which I have to tell everyone, I mean, please, please pick a copy up because it's, it's, you, you both did such a beautiful job in, in laying out a very unique, well, design, which that I guess I'm not super surprised about given <laughs> your backstories and where you're coming from, but just, you know, even the, like the fictitious stories and the illustrations and like the whole, the whole flow of it just felt very different, which I think just, just that alone by default puts your mind in a different space, different headspace, and, and uh, opens people up to thinking differently and being open, which is a beautiful thing that you, a beautiful gift that you provided all of us as, as readers and consumers of that, of that product. But I'm curious, like going through it yourselves, how has the book itself and going through the process helped you, uh, get real clear on I'll go to the the main the the main question of the book like what does a thriving future look like like what does that look like for for, for the two of you and how did the the process help you get there the the speculative fiction that that dots its way across the the book so there's 20 stories in there that are interwoven in the nonfiction that I think uh, let me try to speak for both of us here I think it was probably the most fun to write for us and I can imagine. The, you know, the reason being is like you get to try on this future moment and round out the details of what life is like if, you know, certain features come to pass or if this person crosses your path or if this one technology embeds its way into your brain. And so you get to see, like, do you like how you show up in that world? Is mm -hmm. that something you you want to live in? Or should we be like going back and checking what we're doing right now? And I think that's kind of kind of like a metaphor for at least how I feel about how the book helped me think about the future. One is that there's not just one future. There's going to be so many in parallel. And like by trying on these moments, like by practicing, I feel like I don't know what the future is going to be, but I, I've gotten better at, at, at like seeing how I, 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 how I feel in it yeah. and by like helping others do that too. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I interview a lot of Olympians and, and athletes, which what, what I'm hearing you saying is no different than what we're all used to with athletes visualizing the downhill ski run and we're about to head into the summer Olympics, you know, ripping around the track or whatever. They all do that. It's just, we don't often talk about a lot of that stuff outside of sport. Right. Which, yeah. but this is like, I like your, uh, I might, we'll, we'll see, maybe this will be some sort of episode title, but like trying on the future, you know, in your mind first, which is, I love that concept. I love it. That should have been the title for the book. <laughs> yeah, <it's a> reprint. <laughs> Can we have reprints? Yeah, maybe volume two. Yeah. yeah. I love your take about the athletes because athletes, what they're doing is preparing for the future in a way where they're trying to maximize the potential without really knowing the outcome. Like yeah. they have to be committed to just participating. Right. Yeah. Even though they want to win, they have to know that the odds are they're not going to. And they still put in all that effort. And yeah. I think that's a big lesson. And I, I think in writing the book, it went from sort of wanting to predict the future to getting comfortable with the not knowing. There's a woman who started mm -hmm. a program at NYU called the Interactive Telecommunications Program. Her name is Red Burns. And she wanted to teach her students the anticipation of discovery and oh, how yeah. wonderful that is, you know, and that's there all the time. Yeah. How, how has, cause we're about a month in by the time of us recording this, like what's, 
what surprised you about the uptake of the book or any feedback comments like things you know having written a book myself that's probably one of the things that uh has been the most eye-opening is just some of the the ways people are using the book i'm like i never thought about that that's super interesting and i'm curious there's got to be so many things like that coming up in the first month well, yeah, the, i, I bet the, we the, the same thing yeah. <laughs> you want me to say? I, I think like the thing that I feel like I am most proud of mm. um is that we've had a number of people tell us that they they it's written as one voice and we we are two people and we really we really worked hard so that it didn't come across as one person. And sometimes, yeah. you know, throughout the text we'll have We'll have uh, I in there because it is something that one of the two of us is relaying, but we don't identify who it is. And I think like that has felt really good because there we we bounce this thing back and forth so many times, both in ideas and in actual words. Yeah. Well, you know what I have to say, because I actually I never even thought about that until you just mentioned it. So to even just, just by saying that, I mean, obviously I, I couldn't personally tell, uh, like that unis unified voice is, is definitely there. So I didn't even think about it, which is fascinating. Um, so congrats to you both. And, but I, I feel like people can probably feel that just even in this conversation, like there's, there's a level of chemistry that clearly the two of you have in, in putting this project together and knowing each other as, as humans that, uh, we're experiencing it right now. Yeah, we're I mean, I'm so thankful we got to do the book together. And that doesn't mean it wasn't really hard to write yeah, yeah, a yeah. book as a pair, yeah. right? Because I think the biggest thing is when you're writing a book, it's a certain kind of medium. And it is kind of a solo thing. It's about getting the stuff in your brain onto a page, which is silent. Right. Yeah. And to collaborate, you kind of need non silence. And so we would, you know, we'd work on something and then we'd have an idea, a shared idea, and then we'd go work on it and we'd diverge and then we have to come back and converge together. But there's just no way we would have gotten to anything that's mm -hmm. in there if it was one of us, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and in the in the best way, meaning in the best way that it's two of us, like, I think it's a much better book. And I, I think that's a great lesson like it's a great you know we got to do this together this future has to happen together and to be totally honest it feels like as a society we're having a hard time coming together and there's just no way we're not going to do it there's no way we're going to do it unless we work together and but it is hard yeah. it's yeah. hard and great yeah. hard and great i like that hard and great how, i i probably this probably should have been my opening question but like why did you even how did this book concept even come to come to be for the two of you like why take on the future it's not, that's a pretty big topic yeah i mean there's a bunch of reasons uh we we have that we've been doing this 12 book process uh, project. So we have 12 books that we released. This is the last one. And it just made sense to have the last one be like, where are we going? The first one is, is a chronology of all these activities that we've done at Stanford. And, you know, it's sort of almost like a history or an anthology. And then there are ones that are really about the present. How do you put this stuff to work now? And the last one just really had to be about the future. But as we were writing it, the future really started to become the present. And so had we not <laughs> looked at the future, we would have been behind, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So the fiction stories that Carissa mentioned, several of those came true after we wrote them, but before it was published. So that's in like, say, a year and a half period when Wild, we saw right? them as plausible. <laughs> yeah, we saw them as plausible, but we didn't see them as immediate at all. Yeah. And it's just shocking, you know, so that level of change just feels like you have to kind of be looking ahead to be in the moment, really. Yeah. yeah. What are your, for, for the two of you, there's writing the book, but there's just also just personally and professionally, like, what are the practices, the mental fitness, the rituals, whatever you want to call it, that keep your mind somewhat clear and grounded in some capacity? Like, what are your non-negotiables? I do a lot of mapping and by mapping, I mean like uh, 
uh, my favorite map is a continuum. So a line with two mm -hmm. arrows is a very like simple visual structure. And you can put anything at the end of those two arrows, like things I like to things I don't like. Okay. Things I have a lot of to things I don't. So if you think about there's so many things in our lives and we like to think we can make sense of them in our head, but we're really not that good at it. Yeah. So I love getting out of my head and onto a continuum. You okay. can practice this by like taking five objects from your desk. So like I've got a can here and a book and a picture frame, like line up those objects by something, by size, by how much you use them, by how um, like like worn out the edges are by how heavy they are by who gave them to you by how, how far they had to travel to you right and you see really quickly there are so many lenses at looking at whether it's data from your desk or data from your work or your life you know there's so many lenses that you can look at it with and by getting out of your head and out of the paper that that's my that's my practice that I that helps me a lot does it, does it feel like you clear? I love it, by the way. But does it feel like you're kind of emptying out the mind or clearing things out? Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I cannot think of something new unless I've like taken one idea out and put it down on the piece of paper. Yeah, you know, it's like that. It, it has to be on. And it, paper's key for me. Not on the computer. None of this like digital stuff. Like it just has yeah. to be drawn with my hand. There's also something about like the the using the yeah. hand to codify it, even if it's like illeg illegible, that yeah. is important for me. Well, there's a lot of science that supports that as well. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, I totally agree. Scott, and, and that's you? real. Well, I was going to say just to Carissa, that's real. Like Carissa comes in and she's got these huge notebooks and they're like eight, eight by 10 or eight and a half mm -hmm. by 11 pages. And really she opens them up and, you know, most people it's like journaling and lots of writing. And with Carissa's, it's like, these Venn diagram and then there's like a two by two and then there's a continuum and it's it's just a really interesting way to think because it it reveals interconnections and relationships you know so yeah. I'm always like stunned when she comes back with that stuff because it's not what you don't get a story you don't get like a like a narrative it's like well oh, I'm thinking about it this way and it could work like this and then all of a sudden that opens up all these possibilities that you really weren't seeing it's really cool yeah um on my end, I'm like, um, it, it's weird because most of my work is like visual and physical and in space, but I'm a much more like narrative. I'm just like stuck in my head all the time. <laughs> so my trick is to, as soon as I wake up, I write stuff down before I do any, I don't even get out of bed. I'm just like, I, I, I do it on my phone because I've gotten so fast with my thumbs, you know, yeah. I just pull up the phone, open up notes and just write, 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 write. And it just unloads all that stuff. So it's not like, stuck in there and so usually important. that's where like a good idea comes from because i'm not my critics not really active and that kind of thing yeah yeah it's like you start the day you take your mind to the spa right like I, and that's yeah. the thing that like this is all the, the mission behind all of my work as well is just to show like none of us have said anything yet where we have to go on a 14 day silent retreat and throw on right. a robe and beads not that there's anything wrong with it any of that but i mean your practice both practices literally can happen in in seconds and minutes but the the results of that or the impact literally i mean especially for you scott starting the day like that completely i think i'm biased but completely dictate how your day is going to go because you're starting you know in a, in a very intentional way and in clear mind and basically what happens is you deal with the thing that you need to deal with, right? So like sometimes yeah. it's like a complaint about the day before for, you know, two sure. pages with the text. Other times it's like, oh my gosh, this idea I've been thinking about and I'm going to work it out and da, 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 da. And you're not, you're not at the point where you care whether or not it's good. <laughs> you know, you're just getting yeah. it out and then it feels great. Yeah. Is there something in, in doing the research for the book or just going through the process of the book where there was a practice that came up that you know, is, is one that really stands out that's like, wow, I never really re would have thought of that. I think this is an interesting one that I'd like to apply. Well, I mean, there's ones that I do less of that I probably should do more of. And one of those is um, this idea of when you set goals to also set the the anti goal, the opposite of it. Oh, interesting. So this idea of like using the flip 
of what you're aiming to do as a way of really defining your values and what you're actually trying to accomplish. And it's surprisingly so much easier to name the opposite than it is to name the thing that you want. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And and for me, there's some that are like the Derive as an example, right? Like when you first start talking about it, it sounds like why, like it's not productive. It's not. Yeah, don't get me started. uh, (laughs) And there's another one in there that we just did with a group of people that I mentioned earlier. It's drawing your monster. Mm -hmm. And so we literally had people draw these like monsters that you might find on these medieval maps, you know, these fish creatures, but they can draw whatever they want. And there's something about it where it takes the fear and it has fun with it. You know, there's a playfulness yeah. with the thing that you're most worried about, which can be very hard, you know, because we do have real worries. But yeah. the act of kind of bringing it down to size, it's almost like listening to a comedian talk about something like really touchy, but it yeah. kind of works. And you're like, ah, oh, it's just there's a relief to it. So this yeah. idea of drawing the things you're most afraid of and kind of making them into these silly monsters is awesome. But I think that's so, I mean, I learned a lot. I, I wrote a profile on Robin Williams in, in my book, and I learned a lot of that in like the power of humor and whatnot. And even just, even for, for many of us that were anxiety loops come up and what, like even the, the, the framing of oh, like, oh, there's things, there's like Susan anxiety, you know, monster back in the head. Like you just kind of, it lightens the situation and disconnects you from, all right, you're there. Uh, I interviewed this guy. He used to, he does a bunch of Jeff Warner's his name and he does a bunch of uh, guided meditations for 10% happier and calm and so forth. And he had this beautiful analogy of it's like, Oh, there's anxious Jason coming to the party. Like you can have an, you can have a cocktail, but you're not staying for dinner. You know, like, it's just like, you can't help but laugh a little bit, but it, Mm -hmm. like, you're talking about yourself here in in a way. And now all of a sudden you've disconnected and they're, they're not sticking around. It's just a personality. It's not you. And you can let that go. Right. The other thing that does is it, is it makes it something that can be shared with others and not a burden you need to bear on your own. And like those monsters that that Scott's talking about on on the ancient medieval maps, like maps at that time were like encyclopedias, Mm. um, less so than navigational devices. So really what they were doing is putting everything they know about this area on the map. And that yeah. monster like has a fin on it because they saw a fin of something go by on a ship, but they didn't know what it was, which is why it looks like half dragon, half shark, half whale. Yeah. And and it keeps it in the public psyche. It says like, we know this much. It could be scary, but like it, it, it puts it out there so that the next time somebody else sees it, they can build on that knowledge. And so if I draw my my monster, my thing that I'm like worried about and show it to you and Scott, right? Like it it takes it out of just me and you can contribute to processing it, to uh, making all of us aware of it, to letting me know that, you know, it's all going to be okay, whatever that might be. Yeah, I love that. Well, last question for you both, just to wrap. I mean, we obviously could talk for many more hours at this point, but I mean, I have to ask you, I mean, what what's your definition or how do you, how are you entering into, you know, the future and, and the, the way, like, how are you looking at the future from a, a mental perspective? Like, what's your, what's your angle, your view? I do have a, a moniker that I'm using, which is because tech is changing so quickly, we're never up to speed. And if you take never up to speed as an acronym, it's N-U-T-S, which is nuts. So just the okay. speed of change is is making us nuts. Now, if you think about that word, it has multiple meanings when it, when, you, when it comes to your mental state. One is the obvious one, like, oh, it's driving me nuts. You know, it's making yeah. me off kilter. The other one is, I'm nuts about that. Yeah, I, You know, I'm nuts about that song, which is just like an excitement about the possibility. And I think we're entering into a future where we are in this elevated state. And if you look at research, the elevated state, whether it's excitement or fear, is not the best place to make decisions from, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So my feeling is like, let's all acknowledge that the, the stuff's making us nuts. And then let's step back and see if we can calm down. The main reason for that is not just personal, though. 
I think because we're in a media world now, more than, you know, we're still in an industrial world, but we're so much more in a media world than we were. We're all interconnected. Everything's intertwined. Everything moves really fast. The, our imaginations are kind of a public resource. And mm -hmm. if you can't take care of your mental health for you, do it for us. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like really, this is the this is the thing we're polluting now. This is the thing that we're building now. It's our own imagination. And uh, I think it's a responsibility to take care of yourself for yourself and for everybody else. Because if we calm down, our social media will calm down, our politics will calm down, you know, our our online vitriol will calm down. It just will that these systems react to us. Yeah, the beautiful perspective. I'll take that for sure. Carissa? I love that. And I love especially that pollution of the imagination. Scott, when he originally said that, it's one of those phrases that I think about every single morning still. And I try to like preserve a few moments before I let my imagination get polluted with the whatever has happened overnight that is going to demand my attention yeah. on whatever device it is that I'm going to need to hold in just a few minutes. Um, I'll add one thing to to all the great things he just mentioned, which is th for me, it's just this ever awareness that even when what we put into the world is working as intended, even when it's working great, it's going to be breaking something else. It's going to mm -hmm. affect somebody differently. And that helps me remember that we're all we're, we're not experiencing the same world as each other and everything affects everything else. And we yeah. have to be noticing the effects of our creations. We want them to work perfectly and they never will. They yeah. just never will. And that can feel depressing if you think of it one way, but in another way, it's back to what Scott said at the very beginning, which is that um, aiming for imperfection or just being okay with that imperfection is key. Yeah. And it, we have to make sure we're not causing harm and we have to shepherd our creations forward, but also know that there is no perfect. Yeah. Well, just being real. I think you, there's a, there's a really nice example in the book that's coming out for me. And that I think it was a shipwreck, right? It's like you create, you, we, we create the ship, but you also create the shipwreck. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, just to add, like, just don't view that from a place of judgment. That's just, this is reality of of things and let's do our best and be open and curious and um you know work together and go along the ride and just be a little lighter right yeah wow. and be ready to adjust to the things that come like they're going to come we have yeah. to deal with them you know yeah huh well i wish we had more time but i mean you the two of you are just such beautiful humans i mean thank you for of course coming on the show but a higher thank you for dedicating a lot of energy towards this topic and writing this book and guiding the the our our future generation. I mean, that is the like you know this, but I mean, I think it's worth acknowledging. I hope you can feel it in the heart or accept it. But just the ripple effect of what the two of you do day in and day out is is exponential and has a lot of impact. So thank you for that. Right thank you for saying you. that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We we really appreciate it. And it it it, it uh, goes a long way to have you talking about it and giving your own perspective on it. Yeah, can I, I know we're supposed to be done. Can I add just like one more little yeah, thing? Yeah, of course. Which is like you, you said we were great humans. I can't remember how you described it. And I'm not putting us in that category, although I will accept that. Um, <laughs> I bet you meet a lot of great humans. And mm -hmm. I don't mean, I mean that because it's very clear that you have a capacity to appreciate things. And I think that's something that is getting lost mm -hmm. to some degree because it's actually more vulnerable to do that. Um, you open yourself up to criticism. It's it, Weirdly, it's kind of hard to appreciate yeah. a lot uh, because it's much easier to criticize, much easier to be cynical. And But when you do appreciate, it opens up all this you meet good people yes you're, the goodness like you it's it's amazing so i really i, I appreciate your appreciation <laughs> oh well re I, i'll received i'll uh that lands straight in the heart thank you thank you well to Thanks. be continued and i'll put all the links of course in the show notes and please everyone pick up the book and 
take a look at the other books. I mean, the, just the website for D School, uh, you'll get sucked in there as well. It's just a lot of beautiful stuff happening and, and great, well, like you say, great people, but great thinking, innovation. Like, the world's a pretty good, awesome place if you choose to look at it in that way, right? So thank sure you. Sure is. Definitely. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us. Thank you.